On Thursday, we celebrated the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Today, I would like to speak about the mercy of the Immaculate Heart, and because St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that mercy is the virtue of the powerful who are capable of giving aid to another, and of the good who are inclined to do so, we will look first at how, after her assumption into heaven, Our Lady is most powerful to give us aid, and then how she is most inclined to do so on account of her goodness and love for us. First, her power. Put simply, her power comes from Christ. Christ is king of the universe by natural right because he is God. Our Lady is queen by grace because she is the mother of God. She shares co-naturally in the dignity of her son and his universal kingship. Christ is also king by conquest because he overthrew the prince of this world by his humility and obedience unto death, for which cause God hath exalted him, as St. Paul tells us. Our Lady is queen because she was united with Christ in this conquest. She is the co-redemptrix. She stood at the foot of his cross. Our Lady is not like the British monarchs who have the honorary title of king or queen, but no real power. The scepter of Our Lady extends over the whole universe. The very angels obey her. Demons are crushed by her head. Excuse me, by her heel. But her power is especially exercised in the souls of men. St. Louis Marie de Montfort wrote, Mary has a right and dominion over the souls of the elect by a singular grace of the Most High, who having given her power over his only and natural son, has given it also to her over his adopted children, not only as to their bodies, which would be of little matter, but also as to their souls. This is why she bears the title Queen of All Hearts. Our Lord said, the kingdom of God is within you. We pray for the coming of this kingdom in the Our Father. In today's gospel, our Lord tells us to seek this kingdom above all else. This kingdom is nothing less than the reign of God in the soul, by grace in this life, and in glory in the next. And it has been given to Mary, the queen of all hearts, to establish this kingdom. Again, St. Louis wrote, She who brought Jesus Christ into the world shall establish his kingdom in the world. But we read elsewhere that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and that the violent bear it away. It is not without reason that Our Lady's children on earth are called the church militant. After the fall of our first parents, God told the serpent, I shall put enmities between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed, she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. From her vantage point in heaven, Our Lady looks down upon the souls of her children fighting for their salvation. She has a perfect assessment of the battlefield. She sees some tired, but courageously engaged in the fight against the devil, the flesh, and the world. And these souls she strengthens with ever greater graces, that they may be vic victorious in conquering themselves and gaining new territories for her in the souls of their neighbors. She sees others fighting, it's true, but because of their carelessness in battle, they are weakened by many wounds and are in great danger of falling. To these she sends potent remedies. These are the souls who are scarred by those habits of deliberate venial sin which are so dangerous to our spiritual life. If these souls receive the medicine of Our Lady, they will amend their lives and recover their strength. If they do not, then the death blow of mortal sin is not far off. Finally, she sees some whose hearts have ceased to beat with the life of sanctifying grace and who would be lost entirely if she did not resuscitate them 
by the grace of confession, of contrition, and a return to the sacrament of confession. And she does all of this because she is the dispensatrix of all graces. Think of the rays of light coming from Our Lady's hands on the miraculous medal. Pope St. Pius X taught in his encyclical Adiam Illum that Christ is the source of grace. Mary, however, is the channel, or she is the neck, by which the body is united to the head, and the head sends power and strength through the body. St. Bernardine of Siena said, Every grace that is communi communicated to this world has a threefold course. For by excellent order it is dispensed from God to Christ, from Christ to the Virgin, from the Virgin to us. And Pope, Saint, Pope Leo XIII taught that in this office of Our Lady, she has practically immeasurable power. And this tremendous power of the Queen of Heaven is at the service of her love for God and for souls. Help is an effect of love. So let us look at what Our Lady has done for us so that we can begin to catch, to catch a glimpse of that fire which burns in the Immaculate Heart. When she gave her fiat to the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation, Our Lady was consenting to a life of pain, and she knew it. She knew the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah. She knew that to be the mother of the Redeemer meant being the mother of a son who would be despised, the most abject of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity, that he would be wounded for our iniquities and bruised for our sins, and that they would pierce his hands and feet. On one hand, there stretched before her a life of suffering, persecution, and exile. On the other, there were the sins of the world, the fallen human race corrupted by that stain from which she alone had been miraculously preserved. There were the thousands of years of expectation of her people waiting for the woman who would bring the Messiah into this world. And the handmaid of the Lord did not think twice. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Later in the temple, the prophet Simeon told her that a sword would pierce her heart, giving her to understand more fully the coming passion of her son and how she was to be intimately united with him in his suffering. St. Alphonsus said that at this moment she offered herself and her son up to all of these torments for the sake of souls. So before Our Lady knew us explicitly, she already bore us in her heart. Her life already revolved around us, her future children, and our salvation. She stood at the foot of the cross as queen of martyrs, and as the lance pierced the heart of the son, that sword foretold by Simeon was buried in the heart of the mother. And she offered this suffering for us. In the cave of Bethlehem, Our Lady gave birth to her natural son without any pain by a special miracle. This was the virgin birth. On Calvary, she brought forth her spiritual children by the martyrdom of her soul. These were the birth pangs of our spiritual mother. After our Lord's ascension into heaven, she remained in the exile of this life for a further 15 years, according to tradition, to instruct the apostles and to pray and sacrifice for the infant church. When finally Our Lady was taken up into heaven, body and soul, it was that so she could, she could all the better assist her children on earth. Since her assumption, she has not ceased to guide and protect the church. As Queen of Martyrs, she fortified the early Christians during the persecutions keeping before their minds the kingdom of heaven for which the martyrs sacrificed their lives. As queen of the apostles, she has guided the spread of the faith throughout the world, showering down those graces without which missionaries and preachers can do nothing. It was she who commanded St. Peter Nolasco 
to found the Order of Mercedarians, who dedicated themselves to the work of ransoming Catholic slaves from the Moors in Spain, even going so far as to bind themselves by a vow to swap places with a slave if it were necessary. On October 7th, 1571, Christianity was threatened by a Turkish fleet of over 300 ships advancing on the Gulf of Lepanto in the formation of a crescent. They had the wind at their back. Against them, 200 ships were rowing into the wind in the formation of a cross. Pope St. Pius V had appointed Don Juan of Austria to lead this fleet in defense of Christian Europe. After five hours of naval battle, the flagship of the enemy was taken and the cross of Christ was hoisted in place of the crescent of the Turks. This was the turning point in the battle and the Turks suffered a crushing defeat. And this victory was unanimously attributed to Our Lady. And to honor her for her protection, St. Pius V included the title Help of Christians in the Litany of Loretto and instituted the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary on October 7th, the day of this victory. There are also the many times in the life of the Church when Our Lady appeared to remind her children of their duties towards God. Often these, apparit these apparitions were accompanied by innumerable miraculous healings, a further proof of her tender love. Lourdes, Fatima, La Salette. But her love for us is especially shown by her healing the wounds of sin in our souls. These wounds are ignorance in the intellect, malice in the will, concupiscence, and weakness. This is the unhappy inheritance we have received from our first parents. From these wounds comes the stench of those vices enumerated by St. Paul in today's epistle. Fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, etc. These vices divide us from God, they divide us from our neighbor, and they cause chaos in our bodies and souls. After the brief moment of pleasure or sick satisfaction which they bring, they leave us sad, lonely, and miserable. They are a foretaste of the hell which will be our lot if we give ourselves up to them. And this is what our mother would deliver us from. She is especially the health of the sick in this regard. And she does this by nourishing the life of grace in our souls with all the tenderness and care of a mother, planting and tending the sweet fruits of the Holy Ghost in our souls and bringing us up to spiritual adulthood until we reach the fullness of the age of Christ. She is most truly our mother in the order of grace. In the natural order, the face or personality of a child will often resemble something of the mother. It is the same in the spiritual order, since Our Lady communicates to our souls that which is most intimate to herself, namely grace. She is the mother of divine grace. In this way, God has established an intimate union between us and our mother. The logic of this truth goes like this. The more we grow in grace and holiness, the more we become conformed to Christ. But because Mary is the mirror of justice, the most perfect image of Christ, it follows that the more we grow in grace and holiness, the more we resemble Our Lady. And as we saw, it is from the hands of Mary that we receive every grace. St. Augustine taught that all of the predestined in order to be conformed to the image of Christ, are in this world hidden in the womb of the Most Holy Virgin, where they are guarded, nourished, brought up, and made to grow by that good mother until she has brought them forth to glory after death, which is properly their birth. Now I'd like to suggest two means that will help us to be more faithful to Our Lady. The first is devotion to the three Hail Marys. Many of you may already be in the happy custom of praying this devotion, but I think it is worth mentioning for anyone who is not. It consists of saying three Hail Marys each morning when you wake up and three, three more before you go to bed. This devotion has been practiced by many saints, 
including St. Anthony of Padua, St. Alphonsus Liguori, St. Matilda, and many others. St. Leonard of Port Maurice recommended it as particularly efficacious to obtain the grace of avoiding all mortal sin, especially sins of impurity. He promised in, an, in a special manner eternal salvation to all those who proved constantly faithful to this practice. Our Lady herself revealed to St. Gertrude, to any soul who faithfully prays the three Hail Marys, I will appear at the hour of death in a splendor so extraordinary that it will fill the soul with heavenly consolation. We often hear that final perseverance is a grace that cannot be merited, but will be given to us if we faithfully ask for it. This is very true, and a wonderful way to pray for this grace is the three Hail Marys. The second thing we can do to cooperate with Our Lady is to develop the habit of turning to her for help. All graces come to us from her hands, so it's only normal that we frequently ask her for her help. St. Catherine Labore, to whom was given the miraculous medal, once saw a vision of Our Lady with gem-studded rings on her fingers from which rays of light fell upon the world. Our Lady explained to her these rays symbolize the graces I shed upon those who ask for them. The gems from which rays do not fall are the graces for which souls forget to ask. Our Lord said, ask and you shall receive. That is the condition. It is a real tragedy that we miss out on so many graces simply because we do not ask. If we understood a little better our Lord's words, without me you can do nothing, we would have a greater sense of our dependence on his grace and would be quicker to ask for it. And we can begin to remedy this negligence by habitually turning to Our Lady for help. We should turn to her for light if we have a big decision to make, since she is the mother of good counsel. We should turn to her for our temporal needs, since she is the help, help of Christians. We should turn to her in sadness and distress, since she is the comforter of the afflicted. We should turn to her especially if we have committed some sin, since she is the refuge of sinners. We should flee to her in temptations against purity, because she is virgin most pure. The idea is that in all that we do and in all that happens to us, we want to keep our souls under the influence of our mother. And this demands a little back and forth exchange. It cannot be all on her end while we remain oblivious to her. So let us remember the devotion to the three Hail Marys, particularly for the grace to persevere in the state of grace until death. And let us give our Mother of Mercy more opportunities to aid us by having recourse to her in all of our necessities. I'll finish with the introit for the Mass of the Feast of the Immaculate Heart. Let us go, therefore, with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a seasonable aid. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.